All right. So last week, uh, we started this. A lot of people heard stuff that they hadn't heard from for, for the, you know, they hadn't heard before. It hadn't really been clarified. And there were some points that we made last week that I really want to revisit and, and uh, emphasize even, even greater. And then actually at the end of this teaching time, we're going to do our small groups like we always do. But we're going to also uh, open it up for question and answers. And Jesse's going to come up here with me and we're going to answer any, if you guys have any questions about what we're, what we're talking about tonight or what we talked about last week, now would be a great time to ask them if you want to ask them in a, in a group forum so everybody can benefit from the answers. And we, you know, we're going to, I'm, I'm going to be um, referencing some material that Jesse taught on here before about the garden, the Garden of Eden. So um, now Acts 10.38 says, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I really want to make the, make the point, tragedy is never judgment or correction from God. Like your, whatever tragedy, personal tragedy, global tragedy, whatever you're seeing, that is never a correction or a judgment from God. That God corrects through his word is super clear. The word of God is, is for correction, for reproof. And his word is how he chooses to correct us. And his judgment has been passed off onto Jesus. Like Jesus has taken the judgment for our things. So I really, really want to emphasize that uh, tragedy is not God's way of correcting people. It's not God's judgment on people. And that's, that's really I want to stress. Um, John 3, 16, we, we, we talk about this a lot because it's the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Right? John 17, 3, now th this is Jesus clarifying what eternal life is. Eternal life is actually to know God, know the Father, and in Jesus Christ whom, whom you have sent. So that's eternal life, is to actually know God. Eternal life doesn't begin when you die. That's called death. Eternal life actually begins when you, when you come into the kingdom of heaven, when you, when you accept this, the gift of salvation, and eternal life is actually knowing God. That's eternal life. Now, the devil could not stop you from becoming a Christian. He couldn't stop you from getting born again. He couldn't stop you from that. He couldn't, he, if he was super powerful, if he was powerful at all, he would probably have been able to do that, right? He has no power. He couldn't do that. But what he can do, because his power is the lie, he is the liar, he is the deceiver, that is his power, is to lie and deceive. What he does to Christians is he lies to us about God, the Father, and he keeps us from actually knowing the truth about him and knowing him. And, you know, Galatians 5, 6 says, uh, the, what works, what, what counts is our faith working through love. To know the love of the Father is what's going to activate your faith. That's what's really going to inspire you to live a life of full faith and, and to just come into that place. So what what the devil does is he has purposely planted lies that are going to stop you from believing in the goodness of God, that are going to stop you from fully trusting God. They're actually going to stop you from experiencing the love of God. It's not going to, you, God's love is for you. God is for you. He is not against you. He's always for you. But if you believe certain things, it can limit you when, when, when you be, what you believe about God is going to determine what you are willing to not only receive from him, but to receive in general. Like if you believe that God brings correction through tragedy, when tragedy comes, you're going to be like, oh man, I, oh God's just judging me again. I just screwed up again. I got I to gotta pay for this. Well, let's not forget about Jesus, the one who already paid for it. Okay? You cannot pay for your mistakes. It's impossible. Like in... In our system, our society today, if you break the law, you have to pay a fine, you have to go to jail, you have to serve the sentence. You know, that's, that's our legal system that's called the law, right? You know, we have some law enforcement people here tonight. You guys are familiar with the law. As Christians, the law is called the Old Covenant, Old Testament. We are not under the law anymore as Christians. We're, we're still under the law of the land. Okay, clarity point <laughs> You still have to obey the laws of the land you're in. But as far as like the Old, the Old Testament laws, the laws of like to get you closer to God, those, those were never meant for you. 
Those were never meant for the New Covenant Church. Those were never meant for the New Testament Church. When you read the New Testament, look at the, what Paul was doing, like he, over and over again, what he was doing is he was stopping the Judaizers, the, the Jewish Christians who had converted to Christianity, who put their faith in Jesus, but then they were like, hey, we love Jesus, he's our Savior, and we love the law too, so we're going to bring along with us. And what they were doing over and over and over again was they were taking these, these new converts that had come in to, yeah, we want to shut that door. They were, they were taking these new converts that had come in to Christianity who had never, they weren't Jews, they had no idea what the law was. Who was Moses? They had no clue. And the Judaizers were coming in and saying, hey, wow, we're so glad you found Jesus. He's our Messiah. In fact, we'll call him Yahweh. And that's what they, that's what actually, you know, Yahweh, anyway. So we're going to call him Yahweh. We're not going to, we're not going to do any of that. Um, we believe in Jesus, but we also believe in the law. And Paul, over and over and over again, he was just like, hey, if you're going to use the, he, he kept emphasizing, the law is not for you. The law is not for you. The law is not for you. Do not, do not, do not try to follow the law. And even today, in today's Christian church, man, what do we do? Well, let's teach the kids the Ten Commandments because we want them to be good. All right, there's some goodness in the Ten Commandments, but if you're trying to teach the kids Ten Commandments to get them to behave, the purpose of the law was to bring sin to life. The purpose of the law was to crush you and to get you to give up and turn to a Savior. When you learn the law after you've come to a Savior, guess what? It'll still crush you. It'll still make you give up. And it makes you a pathetic, non-productive Christian because you're trying to live under the law. So here we are. Faith working through love. Galatians 5, 6. What you believe about God is, is going to determine what you receive from him. Uh, this, was it Psalms 87? Uh, Yea, they turned back and tested God and limited the Holy One of Israel. I think that's Psalms 87. Um, we can actually limit God. What? Somebody? No, that's good. Yeah, I don't, I don't have it up there. Um, it's not, I have it written down on my thing here, but I don't have it. So what they actually did, what Israel actually did was by the way they acted towards God, they actually limited his ability. And this is like pre-Jesus, you know, when God was like, oh, rah, right? Well, he wasn't all, rah, but that's the impression that we have of him. But even, even in that state, we were, we were limiting, humans could limit God by what they did or what they believed. Now, again, the, the religious definition of sovereignty is that God controls everything. Nothing can happen unless he approves or allows it. The last song we sang was about, you know, all, you, know you, you make all things work together for my good, which is entirely true. God makes everything work together for our good, but he doesn't cause everything. You know, like that would be like saying, that would be like saying, my... Dad makes all my always better when he kisses them. But if I stop at my dad makes all my always, I have a really abusive father, right? If I don't include the second part in there, you know what I mean? Like we have to get to that second part. Like he makes all things work together for our good, but that doesn't mean he causes all things. Like my, my mother makes all my always get better when she kisses them. But if I say, my mother makes all my always, stop, end of sentence. Whoa, your mom's really mean, isn't she? She makes all your always. No, she makes them all better when she kisses them. God makes all things work together for my good. He doesn't make all things happen. He's not the one who causes our always, but he makes them better when he kisses them. I mean, like we really have to get simple like this and think of this like kids, like God's not the one who caused you to skin your knee, but he's the one who's going to pick you up and kiss it and say, there, you're good. I love you. Yeah, God, God he, he doesn't control everything. I know, I just said that. I said that out loud. <laughs> I know, <laughs> oops, oops, did I say that out loud? God does not control everything. I'm sorry. Uh, 2, Peter, 2 Peter 1, uh, I think it's verse 1, grace and peace through the, through the knowledge of God. You know, grace and peace. So, uh, here we go. Simon Peter, uh, bondservant and a, a, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a, a faith like ours by the righteousness of God our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. Or some translations say, by the knowledge of God. So 
If you go to this, uh, this slide with the three characteristics, uh, believing this will put you in one of these three paths, um, none of these three paths that we talked about last week, there is no multiplication in grace and peace in these. Number one, you believe, you believe that God is sovereign, so what happens? You become passive because what you do doesn't matter at all. Number two, God causes everything. You know, and let me get this straight. God is sovereign. Nobody's higher than God. But sovereignty, saying God controls everything, way off base. There is no grace and peace multiplication in here. And according to my Bible, 2 Peter chapter 1, it says, knowledge of God is going to cause my grace and peace to multiply. Knowledge of the Father is going to cause my grace and peace to multiply. If I believe he controls everything, I am not having a multiplication of grace and peace unless I'm like taking lithium or Prozac or something along with that or heavy doses of something weird to get my brain to say, it's really okay that God is really, really mean to people because he works in mysterious ways. And sometimes love looks like that. No, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't line up. Like it doesn't line up. Like there's, there's a huge disconnect. And what the disconnect is, it's there to separate you from understanding the love of God. It's there to separate you from your faith being activated by the love of God. Did I turn that? Did I turn the furnace on the wrong way? <laughs> did I shut it off? Yeah, turn up the heat. I mean, see? <laughs> turn up the AC, I mean. So we our grace and peace need to be multiplied by what God is doing or by what we know about God. Uh, James 1 chapter verse 13 says, Let no man say he is tempted by God, because God cannot tempt us with evil. James 4.1 says, where does the quarreling and strife come from? It comes from our imaginations. It comes from our desires, not from God. He's not the author of this stuff. So if we, if we believe that God causes everything, then we have to believe that God is the one causing us to have evil desires. Ezekiel 33.11, we hit this scripture a little bit last week, but I didn't spend a lot of time on it. Um, as surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure. Oh, wait, actually, that's not the right one. Hang on. Let's go to... Jeremiah 19.5. This, this scripture right here talks about how God is saying he never imagined what they were going to do to their kids. This is talking about how the Israelites actually burned the sacrifice their kids to Baal. It says he never even imagined it. Wait, isn't this the God that causes everything? Or at least knows everything? Is it possible that in God's sovereignty and his almighty power that he chooses not to know stuff? If, he's, if he can do anything he wants, can he choose not to know something? Can he choose not to imagine what the wicked, what, what sin is going to look like? Can he choose that? You know, as, as a parent, you know, if you have children, like you, you can imagine like all kinds of bad things that your kids can do, or you can choose not to. Like how many of us as parents like say, oh yeah, man, I bet, I bet my son's going to do this tomorrow. It's going to be really bad. And this is what it's going to turn out. No, God doesn't, doesn't do that with us. He doesn't, um, and he knows everything. He's all-knowing. But at the same time, he can limit what he's going to know. It's, it's kind of a mind-bender. But it, there it is, Jeremiah 19.5. Now, let's go into the garden. Genesis 1.28. Created to rule together. Jesse, does that look familiar, that slide? I just pulled it right out of one and dropped the other one. God blessed them and, and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish, over the sea, over the birds, over the sky, over every living thing. This is the garden. This is Adam and Eve. This is his two kids, Adam and Eve. And God is giving them the entire world. He's giving it to them. He literally is giving it to them. He's saying, here, this is yours. Subdue it. Boom. There you are. It's yours. Now, <laughs> Ezekiel 28 talks about Lucifer in the garden. Now, one of the things, and I'm going to wrap this up in 15 minutes, so I'm not going <laughs> to, there'll be questions on this one, I'm sure. One of the things that I was taught, and I know a lot of people get taught some weird stuff about, like Lucifer and, you know, God put Satan in the garden to tempt Adam and Eve. God didn't put Satan in the garden to tempt Adam and Eve. Would you put a serpent in your children's pack and play? Does that make any sense? This is like, seriously, does that make any sense? Like, oh, God is so good. He put... The devil there, he's so good. But at the same time, the devil is there, right? Okay. And I know there's some lots of like really 
interesting doctrines about, or not, well, some of them are doctrines about Satan and Lucifer and all this stuff, and where did he come from, and he had this kingdom on earth before God, and he, God kicked him off the planet, and well, okay, whatever. Now, Ezekiel 28, well, there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, and some of it's pretty flimsy. All of it's pretty flimsy. In fact, what I'm about to say is super flimsy too. So <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> this is really flimsy, but it's scriptural in a way. Ezekiel 28 talks about Lucifer being in the Garden of Eden. Not where the Garden of Eden is going to be, but Lucifer's in the Garden of Eden. I'm not going to go through all the scriptures, but you can look them up. Ezekiel 28, Lucifer is in the Garden of Eden. Now, what if God actually, and he's called the anointed cherub, but cherub is an angel that protects. It's like a guardian angel. What if God took Lucifer, put him in the garden, and said, protect my kids? Rather than, hey, here's the devil. Kill my kids. What if Lucifer is in the garden as the anointed cherub, the guardian angel, the protector, in the garden, Adam and Eve are there. Lucifer is looking at Adam and Eve, and he says, wow, God sure loves you guys. In fact, he gave you this whole earth. What has he given me? I've been working for him all this time, slaving away in his fields. Hmm. <laughs> Sound familiar? So then he says, wow, I bet you I could steal this from you guys. What if that is what happened? Just saying, what if that's what happened? Because then it would actually line up with scripture um, in a way, in my way. And <laughs> Ezekiel 28 there's Lucifer in the garden. All of a sudden, he tempts Adam and Eve. We know, that he, we know that he stole dominion from mankind, right? Wouldn't it make sense if he stole dominion from mankind at the same time as he fell? Like, wouldn't that kind of make sense a little bit? I don't know. Um, so he, he, he tempts him because God's not going to put a serpent in a, in a pack and play, but he will put a guardian next to his children. Lucifer falls at the same time as he tempts him. Anyway, that's not a major doctrine of this church, so if you don't agree with it, that's totally cool. But my point is, you wouldn't put a serpent in a pack and play. And if you have a good God, a good father, like the whole idea, whether you believe that Lucifer was there as a cherub to protect him or not, that God put Satan in the garden to tempt Adam and Eve, that's really warped. That's warped thinking. And I know that's taught a lot. And I just want to totally say that doesn't line up with, that doesn't line up with the heart of God. There's no scriptural stuff in there to make that work. This super flimsy, and you just need to get rid of that doctor and just flush it. You don't need to replace it with mine. <laughs> you don't need to replace it with mine. I'm just offering it as an alternative idea for you to do some research. I don't want anybody saying, well, I'm going to believe that for sure. Ezekiel 28, is that in the Bible? Look it up. Like, just look it up. Don't believe me because I'm saying this stuff. Look it up. Like, confirm this stuff with, with God, with the Holy Spirit. And if he says, ah, then listen to him, not me. All right. So, God gives Adam and Eve, he gives them dominion over the earth. He gives them, you know, and it says God, he, God set limits on creation and he determined the, who has authority. Like that's what God did. He, he, he set limits. Like God set all this up. He set this up in Genesis. He's given man authority over the earth. Now, in, in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, he says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you will surely die. And he wasn't talking physical death. He was talking like spiritual death. And that's why we talk about getting born again. Now, what you need to really, like, you need to get this. It's important to realize how much God values us to have choices. If God valued, if God was, I don't know how to say this right, but I'm just going to say it. So if sin, here's sin, here's free will. If God wanted to keep us from sin more than he wanted us to not have a free will, he would have put the tree on top of Mount Everest. And said, don't go there. And it would have been impossible for us to do, right? So God has, God has given us free will. Like that's, you can't deny that. God has given us free will. And he tells us, like, don't do this. Don't do this. And he's like saying, don't do this. And what happens? Well, Adam and Eve, they do it. They do it. They're like, well, and, and you, you read scripture, it says, Eve was deceived. 
but Adam chose. And Adam's choice, like Eve was deceived. Eve, Eve was deceived. It says Eve was like, hmm, all right, I'll go for that. Adam shows up, and he's like, oh, shoot, I forgot to tell you about that. I mean, because it's Adam. God told Adam. I didn't tell Eve. God told Adam. He sees Eve eating the fruit, and he's just like, oh, did I forget to tell you that about that one, honey? <laughs> oh, boy. Hmm. Hey, you want some? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's like, yeah, you bet. Of course I do. Oh, he, he was really in trouble. Okay, <laughs> he was in trouble either way. Now, the thing to get with Adam and Eve is that they were one person. Like they really were. Like they were really one flesh. And, and they were pulled apart. You know, you can see that Ad, Eve was taken out of Adam. Like Adam and Eve. I'm not going to get into that, but okay. But it's, it's in there. It's in there. So Adam willfully chose. Like he wasn't deceived. He was like, oh, I see. I would, I'm choosing Eve over God. Right now I'm choosing to be in relationship with my wife rather than in relationship with my God. He makes a conscious decision. In his decision, authority gets transferred. He lose, Adam loses authority. If you look at authority before the fall, you have God, you have Adam and Eve, and you have nature. Now, authority, what does authority look like after the fall? Well, you've got God. He's still sovereign, but he's, he has given. God has, God has given authority, has given dominion to Adam and Eve. In the curse of sin, God says, hey, guess what? Like, you're going to, you're, in, he, you are now cursed. Like, you are cursed by the sin. Like, sin has cursed you. And they are not, they don't have authority over this earth anymore. In fact, you see in Scripture, it calls Satan all of a sudden becomes a prince of the power of this, of this world. And, the, and then you have this kingdom of darkness established on, on earth. Sin is established on earth. Now, When, the, when Jesus came, all of a sudden authority got restored back to what it's supposed to be. Like, we have God, we have us, Adam and Eve, and then we have nature. Like, here's the deal. Like, you got to get this. God, he's at the top. We, yeah, we're, yeah Adam and Eve are equal. Okay, that's not point. <laughs> that's a different message. Okay, Adam and Eve, yes, equal. So, but we have been given authority over this world. Like, we have authority. Now, when we believe, when we believe that God, that God is sovereign, but he has given us authority. He gave Adam and Eve authority in the garden. Jesus came and he restored it. He restored us back to where we were in the garden. We have authority here. When we believe the lie that God is controlling everything, when he has clearly given us authority, we're going to be sitting in the passenger seat in the garage waiting for the car to drive away. And he's not driving the car. Like, that's our job. Like, he's, given us, he's given us the keys to the kingdom. Now, in the beginning, I said, what you believe about God is going to limit what you, is going to, is going to dictate what you receive from him. It's going to dictate what you receive, Period. Because if you believe he's in charge of everything, when sickness and disease and poverty and guilt and condemnation and shame, when that stuff comes to you, you're going to think it's from God, and so you're going to receive it. You're going to receive it. You'll be like, oh, man. You know, it would be like if Melissa, you know, if Melissa, you know, all of a sudden a, a box of chocolates come back there. And I'm like, oh, here's a note from the woman you love. Oh, Melissa gave me chocolates. I eat them. What if they didn't come from Melissa? What if they came from some wacko? You know what I mean? All of a sudden, I'm eating chocolates because I think they came from my wife. If we think stuff's coming from God, and we're like, hmm, wow, those had x lax in them. Oh, God, why did you do that to me? Melissa, why did you put x lax in my candy? You know, like all of a sudden, it's like, wow, my wife is a little different, isn't she? She loves me so much, she gives me chocolate with x lax in it. Hmm. Someday I'll have to talk to her about that, but I'm not going to question her love for me because she just loves me so much. That would be really weird. Like I have, like when we think it's a gift from God, when we think like sickness is a gift from God or our struggle is a gift from God or he's trying to refine us, we're not going to fight against this stuff. We're not going to fight against this stuff. When, when, we think like a, when we think like, for example, this Ebola thing, like if we think there's an like Ebola breakout going on right now in Africa, like if we think Ebola, oh, has God judging those people over there? There he's just getting judged. 
They must have done something really bad. We think that, I mean, it seems ridiculous when I'm saying it, but people, there's right now, people are thinking this right now. Guarantee it. Christians right now are thinking this. Not all of them. Some of them are. And this is an extreme example, but we, we see stuff like this all the time. We're like, well, and then when we think it's from God, we don't, one, we don't help other people. And two, we don't help ourselves. If we think it's from God, we're not going to be like, well, I don't know if I should do anything about this. And, you know, if we, th- if we think sickness and disease and all this stuff is coming from God, what that does is it prevents us from fighting, it prevents us from stepping into authority. And ultimately, it prevents us from knowing God. It really, really does. It prevents us from knowing him. And our faith is perfected in love. Our, our faith is activated in love. And if we, don't ha- if we can't put faith and who he is, and what he's doing. If we're putting faith in like, man, I don't know, I don't know why my wife is punishing me with poison candy, but I'm just going to keep eating it because it's from her. Huh? Really? And then I get home and I'm like, man, Melissa, I ate that candy and it really made me sick. I don't know why you did that. She'd be like, what candy? What are you talking about? Yeah, but God is not saying like, what are you talking about? God is saying, oh. He's like looking at us. Sometimes we're like, man, God, I don't know why you're doing this to me, but and he's like, I'm not doing it to you. I'm not doing it to you. I'm not doing it to you. You know, there's a funny, I'm not going to go there. Okay. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. This makes it really clear. I covered this last week, but it's really, really clear. Jesus says, in Deuteronomy 28, he goes through blessings and curses. Bless, he says, this is bad. This is good. Death, life. Death, life. And then he makes it really clear in this verse. He says, hey, hey, guys, I have given you Death, I've, this is curse over here. This is life over here. Choose life. Okay, <laughs> he, he, made, he differentiated between the two really, really well. And then he says, in case you haven't figured out the answer to this pop quiz, it's life. Choose that one. Choose life. Please, choose it. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said or will he and that he will not do it. And then Titus 1 and 2, in hope of eternal life, which God made that cannot lie. God cannot lie. He cannot lie. When he, put, when he created this earth and he gave Adam and Eve dominion over it, and he said, you guys are in charge, he's not going to take that back. You know what I mean? He's, he's done this. Like he's not going to take it back. Jesus came to restore the order. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, you can ask Jesse because she's coming up in a minute. All right, John, John 1, or 1 John 3, verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it does not know, did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has, and it has not appeared as yet, what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. When we see God as he is, we get transformed into his likeness. This bad sovereignty of God doctrine, like this false teaching that God controls everything, does not let you get to see who God is. It perverts your view of God. When you understand that when you get to see that God is love, like he doesn't cause the sickness, he cures it. Jesus didn't come to kill the people. He came to give them life. God is not the author of your problems. He's the answer to your problems. When you get to see God for who he is, you become like him. You become transformed like him. Scripture talks about how it actually was taught to me, and this is a common teaching, like anybody who sees God is going to Right? If you see God, you're going to die. Eh, okay. If you see God, you're going to be transformed in his, into his image, and your mortal body cannot contain it. All right? In fact, there's actually, in, in what is it, Exodus, uh, Deuteronomy, the 70 elders that actually had dinner with God. On the, yeah. So you can see God and live. Just getting that out there. Now, when we see, when we behold the Father as he is, we will be transformed into his image. That is what all of these weird, deceptive teachings that have crept into the church 
a lot of this stuff is pure, I'm going to say it's pure heresy. Like it's pure heresy. It does not line up with the gospel. It does not line up with scripture. It doesn't line up with anything biblical. It doesn't line up with the cross of Christ. A lot of this teaching is anti-Christ. It's anti-cross. It's anti-Christ. And, and we really, like as a church, as Victory Center Church, we're taking a stand on this stuff. We're not, going to preach, we're not going to preach anything that's contrary to the cross of Christ. We're not going to preach anything that's contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, this is who we are, and this is who we as a body need to be. Not just saying this local body, but the body of Christ needs to get back to the gospel. It's time we got back to the word of God. We get back to the gospel. And we believe, we believe God is who he says he is. Not, not our doctrines, not our teachings, but what does the word of God say about our God? What does Jesus Christ say about our Father? That's who our father is, is who Jesus says he is. Not some stodgy guy wearing a suit on the cover of some magazine. You know, Jesus Christ says, my, my dad is good, then my dad is good. Okay? Jesus Christ says he came to heal the sick, then he came to heal the sick, and that hasn't changed. All right? We need to believe the truth. We need to, we need to get rid of this antichrist doctrine. We need to get rid of anything that is contrary to the gospel. We just need to flush it. We need to get it out of our system. It needs to be taken away like yesterday's newspaper, just in the trash, gone forever. Not recycled, burned. Not like a newspaper, like something that we could burn without being unpolitically correct here. So I just, wanna, I just want you guys to know that when, when we really get to behold the Father, when we really get to see who God is, like we will be transformed into his image. We will be transformed into love. We will not be able to contain ourselves. We will not be able to contain our... We will have to temper our enthusiasm to share the love of God because it is so good. It is so powerful. You're not going to be scared to talk to people. You're going to be, you're going to be like, you're going to be scared to talk to people because you're like, man, I don't want to come across like I'm crazy, but I'm crazy. You know, like the Apostle Paul said, if I'm crazy, it's for God. If I make any sense at all, it's for your benefit. Because the Apostle Paul got it. He got a glimpse of the Father. I mean, he, he saw Jesus for who he was. He didn't, you know, he, he, he didn't when he was Saul, but when he had his Damascus Road encounter, when he got to see who Jesus was, it changed everything. It changed everything. And we just need to get to that point. We need to get to see God for who he is. So Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for, I thank you for just stirring us up. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your promises. I thank you for always being faithful and always being good, God. And we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. And we want to see you more. We want to see you more. We want to see you for who you are. We want to see your truth. And we want to become, we want to become your truth, Lord. We want to be, we want to be who you say we can be. We want to be who you say we are. Thank you, Jesus.